have you all here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is what cats can teach you about empathic game design. I know. It's a weird title. It's also great. Uh, my name is Willem. I am the founder and CEO of a little company called Mew and Me. Uh, basically, we make video games for cats. Um, I'm going to get more into that in a second. Let's get started with the talk first. I'm going to start with a moment that I think all of you are familiar with, and I want to do a little exercise here. I want you to, I'm going to read this story, and then once I finish reading it, I want you to raise your hand if you've had a moment like this, okay? And participate. Come on, it's more fun that way. Here we go. So this is from The Art of Game Design. It's a good book if you haven't read it. There was once a racing game that was about halfway through development when the client came in for a review. After toying with the prototype for a few minutes, he looked at the team and said, these cars need more chrome. The lead engineer was panicked. The performance was tough as it was, and adding shiny chrome meant more drain on an already overworked CPU. He could have said yes, and he could have said no, but instead he said the only wise thing. Why? Why do the cars need more chrome? And what the client said was surprising. Well, as I was playing, I kind of felt like the cars weren't as fast as they should be. I know changing the car speeds would probably be a lot of work for you guys. So I was thinking that if you just put more chrome on the cars, well, it would make them look faster. OK, do this with me. How many people have had a moment like this? Right, everyone. OK. <laughs> so communication with the client, communication with the user, communication inter-team is difficult and fails a lot of the time. I'm just going to get straight to the point, because um, I can be a very blunt person. My thesis for this talk is basically that relying on that verbal communication is making you a worse game designer. That there are so many moments where unless you're digging deeper and actually getting to the bottom of what somebody is saying, you're going to miss out and design something worse. All right, so to give you some context, uh, this is Mew and Me. This is the little company that I started back in 2017. As all the best companies go, it was started just as a fun side hobby. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot of my cat, Fez. He's my first indoor cat. Um, and my first cat, were, who was a single cat, no buddies. So I felt guilty. I made him some games. People thought it was cool. It got more serious. Um, to tell you about the product so that, it under, so that this talk makes a little more sense, these are automatic games for tablets that you leave on for your animal while you're out of the house, vacation or work or whatever. These games automatically cycle throughout the day. You just leave it running. And they're experimenting and learning about your cat while they do so. They're tracking that data and showing you that data, giving you that connection to your animal that you wouldn't have had before. So this is our first prototype. It is Cocos-based, if you know what Cocos is. So that means it runs on web. So you're opening up a website to open this up. It is uh, entirely designed because we had some people who were watching YouTube videos, putting on YouTube videos of birds and stuff like that. And so I was like, OK, I'll fill that hole, right? So take a second here. Do you think that this worked? You don't need to say it, just think. OK. Here's our first user tester. <laughs> so that's my cat. That's Fez, um, my little dude. Uh, he is the, to this day, one of the least engaged cats that I have ever tested with which is just so typical. <laughs> um, so yes, it did not go very well. This first test did not go very well. And as I said, this is a hobby at this point. It's not working for the one purpose that I was building this for, to keep Fez company, to give him something to do. So I started doing a, it a little bit more seriously. I started testing with some actual users. Um, and I just sent it around to some friends and family, still very hobby-esque. Nine people tested this, nine cats tested this. It's a web prototype, no actual physical interaction, no touch. Um, two cats watch the device, one cat interacts, doesn't really stay engaged. So this leads us to uh, a 33% engagement, <laughs> um, which is, I don't know, that's okay, maybe. 33% um, of your, if you can hit 33% of your target audience, maybe you're doing all right, but we knew we could do better. 33% is not exciting. And this led us to our first discovery. This is just standard playtesting at this point, right? Which is that cats get bored without feedback. It makes a lot of sense. If you think about your own human motivations, when you are fighting a big bad boss, if the big bad boss doesn't lose HP when you touch it, why are you fighting the big bad boss, right? Unless you're masochistic, maybe. Maybe you're a, a Dark Souls fan. Um, 
So cats get bored without feedback. We knew we had to give them some form of touch interaction. This is also, I don't think Laura is in the audience, but we talked to somebody else who had built some uh, cat games, and they tipped us off that cats actually think they are hunting while they are playing. We're like, okay, we need them to think they're hunting, so we're gonna build some new prototypes. We're gonna make them touch-based, so that way they'll actually get some interaction, they'll get to kill the prey. Um, and, uh, and just for the sake of testing, we made three different prototypes, all a little bit different. We were kind of hoping we were gonna see like cat segments. Um, and we went and tested these prototypes. So here's footage of a couple of these tests. Once again, don't need to do it verbally. Tell me if you think this worked. <laughs> well, the answer is uh, kinda. Um, yeah, it went better. So this is a touch prototype now. The art is still pretty much the same. Uh, we went to cat cafes. We were getting a little bit more serious here. Um, <laughs> and we had, of the 29 cats we tested on, seven cats only watch, and then separate segment, six cats actually engage, actually attack the device. Um, zero cats gave us their thoughts. So it's getting better. Six plus seven out of 29, we're looking at 45% engagement now. That's, that's good, right? 45% engagement overall is pretty good. Now, the problem with this number is that we were entirely focusing on uh, analytical data, right? You can't communicate with the cat, you can't be like, hey, is it better now? So we went and talked to users, and the users told us something very important. It was not getting better. Um, of, the, of the users we talked to, the pretty much unanimous answer was that watching doesn't count. That a cat sitting and watching this device, even though to us, makes sense as some form of stimulation, it's like looking out of a window maybe, to the users, it doesn't actually count. This is a video game. They want to see some physical action, right? So our actual engagement is like 20%, much less exciting. Now, around this time, uh, we had gone to a conference called Wisdom 2.0. If you don't know it, it's a pretty interesting little thing. Um, sort of goes over the uh, emerging conscious landscape of business. And we saw this woman there named Danielle Credick. She is the head of the Empathy Lab at Google. Um, her whole thing is that she thinks you can use empathy to improve Google's products, and more interestingly, uh, improve their AI. So she's trying to learn about empathy so that she can make her AI better. And she brought up empathic design, emotional-based design. And we thought that was kind of interesting, so we went looking, we did some research. If you Googled empathic design, um, this is probably the example that you would run into. So uh, this is this Italian company named Milano. Um, they make all kinds of things, but they decide to enter the baby bottle marketplace. Um, they immediately start testing in homes. Uh, so the, the definition for empathic design, if you didn't see it up there, is experiencing what your end user experiences with your end user. And as far as definitions go, that's not that much different from standard play testing, and I'm gonna talk about that more. Um, so they go and they do in-person tests with kids and in-person tests with parents. And with them, they bring some child behaviorists uh, and just do some of their own research. And they start noticing something pretty quickly. One, intellectually, they notice that no one prototype seems to really work for all the kids. Uh, and through this, uh, the child behaviorists that they have and through the information that they know, they start to identify that different developmental stages for children simply need different bottles. The next thing they notice is more emotional. They're talking to parents. This is more unexpected. Um, through the parents, they're trying to figure out what features, what products are gonna get the parents excited, right? And what they discover is ultimately, the thing they actually care about, the thing that the parents actually care about, is very emotionally based. It is that they want their kids to be independent. In this specific example, they want their kids to be using cups, right? And they wanna get their kids to using a cup as fast as possible, because then they can feel good and special and their kid is independent. So, they have this intellectual side, and they have this emotional side, and they combine it to make a really simple solution. They create three different baby bottles, each one for a different developmental stage, each one moving more towards using a cup. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I like it. A little more in-depth than standard play testing. Um, how does it apply to game design? And that was when I found empathy mapping, and from anything else that you might take away from this talk, this is by far the most useful tool that I have found. Really, really straightforward, really simple. There are more complicated examples if you wanted to go looking. I found this to be adequate. All you do, you make a square per user test per user, okay? In the center, you put a picture of your user, maybe not an 8-bit dude, 
um, and you put their name. That way you just keep them a little more human. You're thinking more about the user and less about the numbers. And during this test, you're recording everything they're saying, doing, thinking, and feeling. If you're looking at a standard user test, I would say 90% of what you're actually going to be recording is probably on the left side of that square. You're going to be thinking about what they're actually saying to you and what they're doing, right? And if they said, hey, I'm kind of feeling defeated, you might write that down. But most of the time, you're not going to spend the moment to get in depth there emotionally. And that's why I love this tool. It's so straightforward, but it forces you to experience things a little bit more emotionally. OK? Here's the problem. <laughs> I'm designing games for cats. Um, <laughs> and of the four categories that is in this empathy map, we think the empathy map is cool. We're like, oh, OK, that might work. Um, but of the four categories, three of them rely on verbal communication. So the only thing that we actually get out of our playtest with cats is what they're doing, right? The only thing we can actually experience with our cat is what they're actively engaging with and how they're actively engaging, but we have no idea why. So communication is our big problem here. Verbal communication has broken down, we cannot use it, and therefore we're pretty weak game designers. We get a fourth of what a standard game designer might get. So understanding has to replace communication. This was our approach. We decided, yeah, OK, we, we have no idea what the cat's thinking, and we'll never be able to confirm that, at least not in the foreseeable future. Um, but we can learn a lot more about them and get more in depth, just like that Milano example. So we did three things. One, we did a lot of research. If you need a good book on cats, Cat Sense and Cat Wise, two of my favorites. Um, we found a lot of experts, some cat behaviorists who we still work with today. Uh, and then we just spent a lot of time with them, and that's your standard user testing. So from the research, we discovered some really important things about cat vision. One is they're semi-colorblind. They have poor vision from within about a foot away from their face, which, fun fact for you, if you ever bring something close to a cat's face, you'll notice at some point it stops actually looking and its whiskers come forward. Um, that is to compensate for that lack of vision. They're feeling with their whiskers instead of actually seeing. Uh, they are motion-based as far as vision goes, and they see at 60 frames a second. These are some high-fidelity cats. Um, <laughs> The experts, they confirmed that watching is some form of engagement. It's like looking out of a window or watching TV. It's something, some form of mental stimulation. And uh, vision is only part of hunting. So vision is a, not an insignificant part of hunting for cats, but smell and hearing especially are super important. And then spending time with cats, we had some interesting moments here. So one, just a fun fact again, we found that different cats actually do prefer different kinds of games. So at some point, maybe next year, I'll tell you about my cat segmentation guide. Um, <laughs> and the other thing was we had very few, like maybe three cats, that we had this really interesting, weird moment with. So I'm going to step back to the empathy map and try to show you why it's a useful tool. So these cats, these like literally maybe three cats, were interacting, were noticing movement, were responding to movement, we're attacking and completely missing the prey. And the first time that happened, we were like, well, that's a broken cat, you know? <laughs> um, but it happened two more times. Um, and so if you, this is a hyper-simplified empathy map, just to be clear. Um, they are normally covered in chicken scratch. You want that to be the case. Um, but with this hyper-simplified map, if we're just mapping out that one cat, and of course taking liberties, because it's a cat, um, we're noticing that it is missing the screen when it attacks, right? we are definitely seeing that they're feeling this sense, this predatory behavior they're actually attacking. Um, and they definitely think there's movement. They're responding to it. But what it's saying um, is, where is it? It's missing the prey. It's sometimes completely missing the device. It's really weird. So I'm going to give you a second here again. This is the original prototype, nothing new here. Um, given the information that we've learned about cats and the research that we did, can you try to tell me in your head, what you think is going wrong with this prototype? Yeah, basically our art style was awful. So we were um, relying really heavily, leaning really heavily on this um, cats think they're hunting thing. And so if the cat thinks it's hunting, then we want it to look as much like it's hunting, right? We want these really realistic art styles. It was what we thought was a strength, because all of the other cat games are really cute and stupid looking. Um, I mean, if you make cat games, I'm sorry. <laughs> I take that back. Um, <laughs> so we learned a couple things from our research and applied it to a new prototype. Um, one was uh, we had to simplify the heck out of our art style. 
we completely took out a lot of the textures. We made the textures really minimal. We made the foreground and background really easy to differentiate. And then one of the more important things is we did colorblind studies. Um, so cats see um, in a particular way that's kind of hard to put your finger on, but it's pretty similar to red colorblind people. So we just used red colorblind filters. And you can see now that that foreground and background blend together and that the actual thing it's supposed to be interacting with really clearly stands out. And that worked really well. Um, we tested once again on 42 cats, still cat cafes, some people in person. Um, 11 of these cats are now sitting and watching. Uh, 18 cats, once again, this is a separate segment, are actually engaging, actually attacking the device. Zero cats told us why they liked it now. So to compare those numbers, um, that meant that our percent watch didn't really change, but our percent engage went from 20% to 43%. And these are, of course, smallish numbers, hard to really use this as hard evidence, but still, we're looking at twice the engagement. Okay, so here's where it gets a little more interesting, a little more applicable to you. Um, if it works for cats, it's probably gonna work for people too, right? So we started doing this exact same empathy mapping, emotional design, with our people, with our humans. And the first thing we did was we started talking to them. If you have verbal communication, you might as well use it. Um, and it didn't go so hot right at first. This is from a woman named Kristen. She is our absolute super user. She is a foster cat mom, um, has tested somewhere between 60 and 80 cats with our tablet by herself. She's amazing. And what she said about our data screen is that she doesn't use it, but she likes it. That's why she tells people about the app. So just to be more clear, make sure you understand, we have this app that is running automatically, tracking what your cat is up to, and then our whole selling point, the whole thing that we thought was really cool, is that it teaches you about this cat, right? We were like, yeah, that's awesome. Users weren't using it. So let's step back to our empathy map again. Once again, hyper-simplified. But what we're hearing from Kristen is that, first of all, she plays in person. This is an automatic app. That's like our whole thing and she's playing in person. She's switching the games manually. She's actually getting annoyed that it automatically switches sometimes. She is thinking, yeah, the data's neat. And I put that in parentheses for a very specific reason. It's, it's neat. You know, it's worth looking at. It's like, yeah, it's kind of cool that the cat was active at 2 p.m., but I have no actual connection to that information, right? She's saying and continuing to say that watching doesn't count, which sucks. And she's feeling, and this is where the, uh, I'm not convinced I would have gotten here without this empathic design. She's saying, she's feeling that she misses her cat. And that alone is not very novel, but what that wound up leading into was pretty important and was a huge pivot for what we were building. We were selling an intellectual product, something that tracks data, teaches you about your cat, to emotional people. So these are people that care desperately about their cats. They care so much about their cats that they're sitting in a room listening to a guy talking about them right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't just mean that cat people are emotional. Everybody is emotional. We are emotional beings, right? Simon Sinek's one of the most famous TED Talks to date. And his whole thing is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, right? They buy the emotional connection. And so what we were scratching at was a way to negate the guilt that you had about leaving your cat alone. We are scratching at some emotion there, but we weren't really empowering it. We were giving them this intellectual hook. We're like, yeah, you can learn about your cat, rather than actually giving them the emotional things that they need from their animal, this like fluffy love, right? Everything, everything that a person actually cares about with their cat or with any animal. So we came up with some solutions, tried to empower them. Um, first thing we did, this is the least exciting one, uh, we tried to convince them that watching does count. Um, this is a very MVP solution right here, so it's just a pop-up that appears at the beginning, try to instruct you. Um, the next thing we did, and this is my favorite name for a setting screen that I've ever created in my life, is the parental controls. So we empower the user to play the app, use the app however they want, so they can turn on and off the automatic capability, they can turn on and off which games actually run. Um, and yes, prey squishing means prey death. We literally had to PGify our app if users asked for it. We had people complaining about killing mice. Um, <laughs> and then the last one, these are emotional people, right? And then the last one is um, we didn't want to throw out the data entirely because it seemed like people were sharing it due to that, um, that like, interesting factor. Like, this is kind of cool, this is kind of neat, this is unusual. 
but no one's really using it. It doesn't have the emotional connection that it needs. So where is, where is that middle ground, that solution between intellectualism and emotionalism? For us, it was basically to take a picture of your cat's art when it's engaging when you're away, or of the cat itself through the camera, and then just to email it to the user. So you're sitting at home, or you're sitting at work, or wherever, and uh, missing your cat, you need some fluffy love, and you get an email in that says, hey, Fez just played the game, and look at this amazing Da Vinci artwork that he just created. So these are our people results. This is why human-centered design works. This is why um, emotional design works. This is about 400 beta testers who were surveyed um, like right before release. Um, of the 400 or so people, we're having over 75% of them call it high quality, at least, for an MVP product. Uh, this is a little bit of data about a month after release. We're seeing um, pretty great word of mouth here. And then to talk about the cats again, because I like cats if you didn't notice, um, why cat-centered design work, but really just why emotional design works. Of the 124 users that we're actually tracking who have signed up, we've had 2,000 games played and over 30,000 kitty taps, or individual interactions, where the cat is tapping the screen. Interestingly here, we are seeing um, each of the games have a pretty healthy population of cats who play it, so we, we are seeing that cat segmentation. And then this is what's actually really exciting, and I breathe such a sigh of relief at this moment. So upon pulling the data and looking at all of the individual games that have been played, we're seeing 62% of games have at least some interaction. So 62% engagement. And this is pretty much the same prototype that people were playing, I was playing in person at that 45%, now at 62. This is not also including Cats Who Watch, because we can't track that, right? So uh, take this with a grain of salt, because it's very possible humans are playing this. Um, <laughs> but you know, we actually figure that's no problem. We will want to differentiate, but we actually figure that's no problem. Engagement is engagement, right? OK, so you've sat through a whole lot of stuff. I'm going to give you a reward. I know why you're here. It's cute cats. <laughs> Um, so a, another interesting fact here is you can see that most of these cats are really getting excited are young. Young cats are consistently our most engaged animals. So the joke I always make is cats are millennials too. <laughs> okay. All right, so these are my key takeaways for this. One is, and this is something you all know, but everybody still falls into this trap all the time, is to empower their use cases, right? You have to leave your ego out of design. You can suspect what your users want, but ultimately you're designing for them. You're not designing for you. We had so many pivots that I would not have called without, using my, without experimenting with my users. The second is to research your target audience. Um, that's not something I really thought of doing, and I find a lot of people, a lot of my own students, don't choose target audiences, right? That's a very newbie mistake. Make sure you've got your audience. Um, and then research them, learn about them, find experts if there are experts. And then three is to use empathy mapping. It is such a simple, straightforward tool, and it forces you to get deeper with users and find things that you may not have found. But really, what I'm hoping I've convinced you of by this point is to spend the time to understand your user and not just talk to them. That's it. Thank you. Um, so we have six minutes for questions. Um, the, uh, feel free to reach out to me through email. I also write about weird stuff like this on my blog. Um, I'm going to hang out here until 30 minutes, and then I'll head over to 204 and hang out there if anyone wants to talk to me individually or, or doesn't get a question in. So yeah, feel free. Um, so you said there's a couple of limitations that cats have. One is how um, they can't really see things that are a foot away from their face, uh, co color blindness, and then refresh rate, mm -hmm. or how fast they see. Mm -hmm. Have you got any metrics on how they work with different devices? What is the best device for them to play these games on? Uh, you're talking about like different tablets? Yes. Actually, I don't. That's an interesting one. I haven't, I haven't checked in on that. That's a curious question. All right. What I keep saying about the tablets is that it's not really the ideal solution. Um, it's just the accessible one. Everybody has tablets, and so many people have tablets they don't use anymore. Um, so eventually, we'd actually like to step into physical, physical stuff, physical mm -hmm. toys that kind of do the same thing. Are, are adult cats better than kittens at your game, or vice no. versa? <laughs> adult cats, um, 
So we're, we're actually working with the VCA to do a study on all of this, um, which is amazing. But uh, so we find that pretty universally adult cats at best are gonna sit and watch. There are definitely some cats that'll play. Um, this is a total shot in the dark. But my guess there is something to do with plasticity, basically. The, the cats have already, cats pretty much establish their personality by like one and a half years in. And so if they haven't experienced a tablet and this is a fun you know, toy, within a year and a half, they probably just, it just doesn't get learned later in life. That was a very good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know, um, you also said that cats rely on hearing when hunting. Uh, did you guys try to introduce sounds to maybe uh, for them to early engage with the game and maybe keep them focused? Yes. Uh, I neglected to mention that. In fact, I meant to. My sound designer is sitting right there. Hi, Matt. Um, so we hired a, a professional sound designer to try to make 3D-enabled sounds. Um, we did see some engagement increase from that. Another one? <laughs> Have you tried it with big cats? No. <sighs> one day. <laughs> We need some big tablets. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool. So I'm going to hang out in 204, like I said. I'll be there if anyone wants to talk. Otherwise, thank you for coming.